their class within the church setting or in the college setting. Our pericope today is 1 Peter 2, 18 to 25. Uh, I've used the New Revised Standard Version throughout. <clears throat> Reading the passage, if I could have um, Tiffany uh, read the first four verses, please, 18, 19, 20, and 21. Recipients of the letter. Well, they were just Jews and, and Gentiles. And okay. Maybe like a blend of Jews and Gentiles. Yeah. Okay. They were Christians. They were Christians, and that was the most important thing, right? They were Christians. Uh, Danielle, could you please briefly explain why Peter was written? Um, Peter was writing to encourage his readers under persecution. Very good. They were under persecution, so he was writing to encourage them. Uh, Scott. Could you please name two major themes of 1 Peter? Major themes, not, you know, I know there's 15 of them, but. Aliens, sojourners, uh, and uh, purity of living. Okay, but I mean, uh, themes as far as what were, when you read 1 Peter, what, what two big themes pop right out at you? <coughs> Any, do you want me to go to someone else? Suffering. Yes. Suffering, excellent. Anybody? Second one? Okay, that works. Does anybody have another one? Being encouraged. Encouragement? Okay. I was thinking, uh, what about 1 Peter 5, 12? What theme does that mention? Does anybody know right off the top of your head? Well, suffering and encouragement and being glorified into the presence of, or into the, the nature of God. Okay. Peter 5, 12. And, well, in 5, 12, there's a mention of grace, right? Yeah. Okay. Grace. I'll go the Yeah. <laughs> this is the total, the total grace of God. Okay, so uh, that's what I was looking for was grace and suffering. Very good. Okay. Um, in order to read this passage and understand it properly, we have to change our mindset as to what slavery really is. We think of slavery in terms of 19th century slavery, uh, 20th century uh, black and white segregation. Not the case here. And if you want to do more study on your own, I, I would recommend this book, The World of the New Testament, editor uh, Joel B. Green. Excellent book on anything historical in the first century. Really, really helps for understanding. So let's take a look at this really quick. Develop a better understanding of the meaning of 1 Peter 2, 18 to 25. That's our main objective. And, and another one of our goals is to discover something new about first century slavery in the Roman Empire. A 
brief overview of slavery. 1 Peter 2, 18, 20 is addressed to household slaves. Now, this is because of the word used in the Greek, oikos, it's not doulos. Um, some scholars feel that they're interchangeable, but because oikos, um, and I'm probably even saying that wrong, but because of oikos, there's an idea of household. So they could have been types of slaves associated with within the family. Uh, it is thought that there's approximately, there were approximately 12 million slaves out of 16 million people within the Roman Empire. Slaves were sourced through conquest, through birth, that's birth within the, the, the home, or sale. Physical and sexual violence against slaves by their owners was regarded as right and proper. And uh, that included beatings, torture, and sometimes death. But because of legislation, there was legislation uh, through the Roman government for slavery. So death, you really had, a good, had to have a good reason for it, especially as we progressed through the first century. Still, slaves were valuable property. Important facts to know. Now, this is, this is in contrast to our understanding of slavery as we know it in America. Slave status was not indicated by skin color or ethnic racial origins. In other words, you really didn't know if someone that you were talking to on the street was a slave. If an owner was irate, sometimes slaves would leave their owner temporarily. He would flee, hide, until the slave owner cooled off. Think of Philemon and Onesimus. Slaves shared the owner's cultural values, social codes, and religious traditions. If that's true, Chris, why do you think that a Christian slave would cause a problem in that family? Because the owner possibly wasn't. Yeah, religious, religious traditions. Some slaves own property. Some even own slaves. Slaves could purchase their freedom. So they had like an account, and they would save their income as it came in. They were paid. Uh, for the most part, they received some kind of money. Um, they would put it into an account, and they could purchase their freedom. Education was encouraged since it increased the slave's value. Totally opposite of what we know about slavery. We kept them under, cut kept them uneducated in this country. Many slaves worked as physicians, teachers, accountants, sea captains. If the master was rich, owned a, a bunch of ships, who's gonna, who's gonna you know, captain those, those ships? He had, he had his servants. Poor free persons were worse off than slaves. So slaves weren't at the bottom, they were just above the bottom. The poor free people that had nothing, they're the ones that were on the bottom. Many would sell themselves into slavery for the benefits of food, clothing, shelter. They would sell themselves right into slavery. They could even get a step up in the social ladder if they, if they sold themselves into the right family. Slavery was not lifelong. At 30 years old, there was rules as to how many slaves the master could free at 30 years of age. Then it depended on how many slaves he owned. Exceptions were rural slaves. You don't see that a whole lot with rural slaves. Uh, and condemned criminals who were slaves. They served for life. Legislation for the treatment of slaves increased throughout the first century and into the second. That's important. It didn't necessarily increase their daily, uh, increase the, the uh, value of their daily life, um, but it, it definitely, what it does is it underlines how bad their lives were before the legislation. Because uh, these, these legislations that were passed actually gave some protection offered some protection. Looking at our pericope, starting with uh, verse 18, back to slaves, accept the authority of your masters with all deference. This says phobos right here, phobos, fear. Not only those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. Phobos is typically fear. We get our word phobia from that. Healthy apprehension of their displeasure, as defined by Wayne Grudem. They wanted to please their master, so that the master obviously didn't punish them. Uh, it was a healthy apprehension, I like that. Addressing slaves was unique. For, pre, for Peter to address slaves was not common. I mean, people didn't address slaves. They weren't human, okay? They weren't on, we were not on the same level. Peter addressed them, why? Because he saw equality and personhood. Crookiness of masters suggests physical mistreatment, dishonesty of pay, working conditions, and expectations. This is, but also those who are harsh. That word in the Greek, 
we get our word scoliosis, so we know that crooked, that crooked spine, okay? Verse 19, then red, had to be. <laughs> uh, I highlighted the words credit and pain. So in this, in, in this uh, verse, we see that word credit in this particular version. Credit is the word charis, charis in uh, Greek. It has an idiomatic use. It is commendable in the IV. This is a gracious thing in the uh, English Standard Version, or this finds favor. Um, we have all these different uh, translations of that Greek idiom. Pain is, in this case, really griefs or sorrows is the meaning behind the Greek word. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. This is a really cool verse because credit here, he uses this word clouds. That word is something that was used in Greek epics, tales, where you have uh, uh, Greek warriors who are you know, killing everybody in sight in the battlefield, and then they have clouds. They have, they have fame. The reward for great honor and virtue is immortal fame, klaus, which is what guarantees meaning and value to life. Kind of shallow, really, when, when we, from our perspective, that's all they cared about. And yet, he went on to say, if you do what is right and you suffer for it, you don't have man's approval. You don't have klaus. You have God's approval. That word again, cut us. For this you have been called because Christ also, does it say died there for you? Suffered. I know you can't see it, but suffered. Yeah, he suffered, okay, for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. So the example is not died, it is suffer, okay? I thought, I thought this guy was great. <laughs> Following in his steps. Now this is cool. The word example in the Greek, that word in the Greek is used for this right here. Remember this from elementary school? Yep. Tracing. So we carefully trace Christ's example of suffering to arrive at perfection. This is why our teachers had us tracing these letters because that was that's the perfect rendering of A, of B, of C. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. This is out of Isaiah 53. A lot of these passages now, from now on, are from Isaiah 53. He did not sin. When he was abused, he did not retaliate or, or return abuse. When, gosh, where's your notes? Here's your notes. <laughs> Thank you. I got to have <laughs> When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. So no, he kept on trusting. Faith is the key to keep on trusting and knowledge that God will always right all wrongs done to us. Wayne Grudem. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. It is to our own benefit that we are free from sin. We were spiritually dead. The death of Christ brought healing. Uh, I put one stripe here because in the Greek, wounds is not wounds, it's wound. There's a feeling that maybe Peter saw the body of Christ being crucified. It looked like one wound. Couldn't even tell there were stripes. There was one wound. Was so, you know, Isaiah says, he's so marred that we didn't even recognize him. So it's to our own benefit that we are free from sins that we might live unto righteousness. <clears throat> For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. It's interesting, sheep, my mother lived, grew up in a farm and she was telling me that sheep 
They just wander off in search of food. They don't care about what's going to happen to them. Uh, that's you know the dangers of the road, so to speak. Um, and then we have this great picture of a lamb in, in the shepherd's arms, you know, sleeping. He's returned to the shepherd. Um, Olivia, could you grab that back, please? You can take one. Just pass it around. I'm giving you this block of wood is because in the, in, the, in the scripture it says that in his body he bore our sins in his body on the cross I want this to I want to suggest that this represents the cross and in the, in the Greek it doesn't say cross it says wood in, in the Greek the word bore means he carried a sacrifice in his body onto the tree in some versions. So what I, what I would like you to do is think about some of your attitudes, including my attitudes, about those in authority above us. And write on there, if you would, some of those simple statements of negative attitudes. Maybe you've had towards a past employer, um, someone in authority over you. In this case, um, Someone tell me, how do we apply this to today? Obviously, we're not slaves to anyone, but what are we in relation to those above us in this context? Anybody? How about the employer-employee relationship? Does that, would that make sense? Okay. And the reason I did this was, you know, this, it's, it's just a simple piece of wood. But to me, this brings a lot of meaning to this, this verse here. And you can bring it home and you can offer this up to the Lord. Say, this is, these are my attitudes, my negative attitudes that I've had. And you bore this in your body on the cross for me. Just to close, going astray. G equals going astray. And yet... Grace. R stands for retaliation. We tend to want to retaliate when wrongs are done to us. And yet, grace. A equals abused. Sometimes we're abused by our employers. And yet, God's grace. C is the cross. That is the ultimate example of grace. And of course, E for example. Christ was our perfect example for suffering. He himself, Warrison's in his body on the cross. Amen? Amen. 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 Right.